I, we all thought, and I know Sharon did, that it would be fun to look at some uh, imaging for you. And uh, to do that, we're going to ask David Utrainen, who's an imager who works with Mark uh, Hickey uh, at Wayne State, uh, to share with you uh, uh, some more information about the role of iron and blood flow in CCSVI. And this is all magnetic resonance work. David. Pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Sharon and the CCSVI Alliance uh, for staging this here at Viva. Um, I am a graduate of Wayne State University, and I work at MR Innovations. First, I'd like to make some acknowledgments uh, to some people who have provided data and help with analysis. And uh, I'll start off talking about the evaluation and treatment process. Um, how we can incorporate imaging into this. Uh, usually, uh, traditionally, there's a diagnosis by a neurologist, and then we have motor, cognitive, and neuropsychological testing. And at this point, every patient really should receive baseline MR imaging, uh, followed by the angiographic evaluation, possible treatment, which is wonderful to hear that uh, treatment seems to be relatively safe, and the improvements seen in the patients are quite good. Um, followed by post-angio MR imaging and post-angio motor cognitive and neuropsychological testing. The focus of my presentation will be on the baseline MR imaging and the bit of data that we've collected and analyzed. So why do we need to perform MR imaging before and after treatment? Um, there's still a lot of questions about CCSVI. We really don't know everything. Uh, However, for an individual patient who's going to approach treatment, um, many benefits are we can monitor lesions and iron content quantitatively. We can monitor arterial, venous, and CSF flow changes. We can use the 3D vascular data to actually plan out the intervention. We can categorize different types of MS patients, and it will serve as a baseline to study the anatomy and flow after treatment if complications develop. So this will be your way to track your progress um, and relate it to things such as iron content and flow through your jugular veins. Uh, so iron, is it a cause or a consequence? Um, what do we know at this point? There's still quite a bit to learn. However, what we have seen through publications is that iron appears in MS lesions. Iron appears in the basal ganglia and thalamus of the brain. Uh, iron in the pulmonary thalamus and substantia nigra appear to be potential biomarkers for multiple sclerosis. And iron deposition appears to increase antigrade to the venous pathway over time. So this further solidifies that there is a vascular venous connection to CCSVI and multiple sclerosis. Um, next I'm going to show a few different images about uh, iron in the brain uh, using susceptibility weighted imaging. Um, here on the far right we see the MS lesions here, and they appear dark because this dark signal is iron within the brain. We see iron buildup in the midbrain. On the right, we have a patient who has normal iron levels in the substantia nigra here and here, and on the left, we have a patient who has very high iron, and it's very dark signal. Um, iron appears as the high iron deposition. Uh, it appears uh, in the vascular rich areas of the basal ganglia, uh, seen here. Uh, the veins actually appear dark because of deoxyhemoglobin within the blood. Um, so here we see high iron in the caudate nucleus and globus pallidus. And iron increases appear in the pulmonary thalamus of MS patients as well, so we do see those there as well. Um, now here I'll talk about the MRV component. Uh, we can collect data that helps us visualize veins and quantify flow through them. Um, this is a very interesting case because to me, I don't see any traditional stenosis or jugular lesions. However, I do see on uh, 3D uh, contrast enhanced MRA that there is a bit of inhomogeneity or narrowing here at the confluence. And then also the left vertebral venous plexus, which is a bit behind the jugular veins, it runs down. We run down. It runs down the vertebral column. It enhances a bit sooner than the right side. Um, also, on time of flight, this is a sequence where uh, outflow going back towards the heart is what generates the signal. 
we see the right internal jugular vein here has very strong signal, indicating a very strong flow. We see a little bit of uh, mixed signal or homogeneous signal towards the confluence as it approaches the heart. However, the left internal jugular vein shows a banding artifact and much weaker signal. So this indicates that there is a flow problem here. Uh, when we go through and use phase contrast MR imaging to quantify flow through the vessels, we can see that the right IGV is indeed dominated, uh, the dominant outflow route for the veins, and the left internal jugular vein does carry some uh, venous net flow out of the neck. Uh, when we break it down into both flow back towards the brain and out to the heart, we see that there's actually a very strong retrograde flow component in the left internal jugular vein. So for me, this shows that although we don't see any traditional stenosis or narrowings in the vessel, we do see that there is an abnormal flow pattern. But this is not to say that we won't see abnormal vasculature and abnormal veins in multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, these are various examples of either occlusion or possible atresia uh, closing of the vessel. And you can see here, we cannot image the vessel on MR. And whether or not if someone goes in with catheter pornography and can actually image this vein and balloon and open it, I'm not sure, but this is what we do see with MR or magnetic resonance. Um, I'd like to show this data here. Um, the blue column is actually from Dup. Uh, he imaged uh, 50 normal controls with ultrasound, Doppler ultrasound, and he took the flow through the IJVs and normalized it against the total arterial flow heading to the brain. Uh, when he did this, he also subgrouped them into three types. Type 1, where the jugular veins were the dominant outflow route, and this is when the jugular veins carried greater than two-thirds of the to total arterial input. Uh, type 2, where we see the jugular veins carrying between one-third and two-thirds, and type 3, where ju jugular veins carried less than one-third of the total arterial input. So for me, this range would be non-functioning jugulars. We did analysis on 100 patients from one site, multiple sclerosis patients, and another 100 from a second site. And uh, we ran the same type of analysis on the data. When we did this, we saw a clear difference between DUP's results and our results. Uh, the jugular veins carried much less flow. So we went further and we actually did an anatomic evaluation of the 3D contrast enhanced data, as well as the 2D time of flight MRV, and we found that uh, many patients actually had stenosis. So when patients had at least one stenosis or more, we categorized them as stenotic. When they did not show any stenosis, we categorized them as non-stenotic. And you can see here, this is the non-stenotic population, which is actually less than half of the 200 patients we looked at. Uh, they look relatively similar, with 70% uh, being type 1, about 30% being type 2, and type 3, we actually didn't find any of those patients in that category. When we quantified the flow for the stenotic MS population, we found that there was a clear shift, especially over to the non-functioning jugular range. Um, many less patients actually had the jugular veins as their dominant outflow route, and many more in type 2. So for me, this is quite compelling and quite exciting, really, because this is actually showing that vascular abnormalities can have a direct impact on the uh, distribution of venous outflow from the brain. And a bit of more results. Um, oh, also, this paper has actually been accepted uh, for publication in the uh, JDIR Journal of Vascular and Interventional Radiology. So that's actually in press right now. Um, so our results, um, this is a plot showing the flow through the dominant jugular vein, uh, normalized against the total arterial flow here. And also the flow through the subdominant jugular vein, normalized against the total arterial input here. Um, and we found the two interesting patterns. So we have this line here that is drawn at the 50% uh, range. So this means that everything to the right or on this side in the shaded region, these people have less than 50% of their total arterial input exiting out of the two dominant veins. And uh, we also have a line drawn here. This is the ratio of 3 to 1 flow through your dominant vein and your subdominant vein. So when we did this, we found that there was a clear separation. And if you notice, there are solid symbols and uh, open symbols. The solid symbols are stenotic population. So these people have stenosis in their jugular veins. And up here, we see most of the open circles or open symbols. 
Also plotted on here are a few normal controls that we scanned at Wayne State University. Um, you can see them, they're the uh, plus signs here, here, here. And uh, actually none of them so far have shown to be at the 50% threshold or lower. Um, and a few of them actually do fall within this greater than 3 to 1 ratio between their dominant and subdominant thing. However, given our findings so far, I feel like these are very strong criteria to be evaluated when we quantify flow. So conclusions. There's still a lot of questions out there. There's still a lot of things that we do not know about CTSVI and multiple sclerosis. However, we found that there may be three risk factors that can be learned from imaging multiple sclerosis patients or things that can be learned from imaging for multiple sclerosis patients. Um, this includes the iron deposition in the lesions, basal ganglia, and thalamus. So with MR imaging, you can actually quantify these levels and track them longitudinally through time. Um, we can look and see is full dominated by one major vein. And we can also see is the total arterial input being carried back through the jugular veins. Um, from what we found is an absolute value, usually this is around 8 milliliters per second or less, we usually find in the stenotic population. <clears throat> so what else can we do as a community to help further the study of CCSVI and multiple sclerosis? Uh, it's something Dr. Hickey has talked about in the past, uh, the Millennium Project, where we come together as a multi-institutional feed of data and uh, we scan as many normal controls as possible. This way we build a very large population to do comparative analysis between normals and the multiple sclerosis patients. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about what I've shown here, about the data or how to have an imaging protocol successfully ran and the sequences which are included, um, you can visit this site here, the ms-mri.com, and it'll provide the MR imaging protocol. It'll show different publications, educational material, and new quantification results as we find them. And uh, one site actually here in Las Vegas that's running the full imaging protocol for CCSEI that we have shown here, or that I have shown here, um, is Centennial Medical Imaging. It's equipped with CT, uh, two 3T semen scanners. It's quite wonderful. They're located at the corner of Buffalo and Cheyenne, so it, it's quite nice. And uh, of course, as a final note, uh, there's a second annual ISNVD scientific meeting coming up in this February 2012. So it's at the Hilton Orlando, and uh, the websites for it, if you would like to learn more, is www.isnvd.org. And uh, this is uh, co founded actually by Dr. Hickey as well as Dr. John Nelson, who is uh, at the Centennial Medical Imaging. Thank you very much. Thank you.